Welcome to Zabin Webinar. In this webinar, we will be talking about how to develop effective assessments for candidate evaluation. Our today's guest is Mark Smith, author of A Better Choice, The Manager's Guide to Skills First Hiring. He has a PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology from the University of South Florida. He has created and validated dozens of assessments used worldwide to measure knowledge, skills, and abilities. And he is also Zobin's scientific advisor. Mark, we welcome you to this webinar. And thanks for the introduction. So today in our webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, developing effective assessments for candidate evaluation. And uh, there's a lot of detail for us to go through. We're going to try to keep it high level. And uh, we'll start here with the, the challenge in modern hiring. And as a lot of you have probably seen and felt in your own organizations, many companies are, are overwhelmed by, by just the sheer volume of applicants that they're getting. Uh, they'll post a job and they'll get hundreds of applicants very quickly. And a lot of these companies, they do want to, to change their approach to more of a skills-based hiring where they're not simply screening based on level of education and number of years of experience, but they get so many applicants that they're kind of stuck and, and don't really know what to do. And to address that, I think that uh, computer-based assessments and computer-based assessments of both hard skills and soft skills can be really a good solution right at the top of your hiring process. So you get so many applicants and as long as they pass some really basic level of, of maybe experience, uh, you can pass it on to uh, an assessment or a set of assessments that will take that high number of applicants and, and bring it down to a reasonable number of applicants that the, the recruiters or the talent acquisition professionals can deal with. And as we think about this, there are uh, standard assessments available from, from us that uh, can address a lot of different jobs, but some jobs require, or it's just really, really nice to have a specific assessment designed for this job. And when you're going to take that approach, it's really important to start by a clear understanding of what the job is. And to get that, you do a job analysis. And in, in a job analysis, you're, you're in a standardized way collecting job information. And you can do that by interviewing uh, incumbents and managers in the job. You can use surveys. Surveys are a really good, good approach. You can use focus groups. In focus groups, you can get some real deep information about the job. And a few years ago, a lot of job analyses would start basically from scratch. You would you would start with a blank piece of paper and you would say, okay, what are the tasks here in this job? What are the duties? What are the competencies needed? What, what types of knowledge and skills do you need? Um, but today in, in, in the US, we have what we call the, the ONET, the Occupational Network. And there are thousands of jobs in the Occupational Network that uh, there are task information, competency information uh, for these jobs. It may not be 100% correct for any given company, but it provides a, a nice starting point uh, for you so you don't, you don't have to start from the beginning. And, and the types of information that we're really talking about is, is specifically asking about the tasks. So what do uh, these people do? And also talking about critical incidents. And so what are some examples of particularly good performance, particularly bad performance? And, and that provides a lot of good, rich information as well. And so after you do the job analysis and you get a clear understanding of what the job is, you have to uh, determine what the content areas are for your, for your test, for your assessment. And um, so you'll, you'll start with specific skills and competencies that are needed. Uh, most assessments are, are going to focus on a limited number of these. And, and so maybe if you need to cover a number of different areas, you'll, you'll come up with a set of tests or a set of assessments. And so each, each test or assessment should have one to three 
broad areas that it covers, but there may be some sub areas that it covers as well. And it's all based on the job analysis. And so it's based on what the job actually entails. Uh, for each of the competencies or the knowledge areas, in order to ensure that it's a true part of the job, I'll talk about linkages. So uh, the, the competency area or the knowledge area needs to be linked to a specific task or a specific duty that is done on the job. And that ensures that the test is going to be job relevant, which is another way of saying the test is valid. Subject matter experts and stakeholders will be involved uh, in this process of, of determining the content areas. And then from this, uh, we're going to start what we call our test blueprint, which is determining that the areas that we're covering on the test and maybe the approximate number of items, or at least maybe the percentage of, of items for, for the test. And so maybe you'll have, you'll have three different um, competencies that you're covering. And then you'll say, okay, each of these competencies will have about a third of the items on the test. And, and uh, after you've determined what are the areas that should be on the test or on the assessment, then you need to, to choose a format. And there are a couple of different formats that you might choose from depending on what you've decided needs to be addressed on the test. Um, you can put together what we'll call a situational judgment test which will have uh, specific examples of situations that really happen on the job and then basically a multiple choice, what would you do or what should you do as a result of this? You can have cognitive ability kind of tests, which that may have um, you know, math involved or it may involve interpreting uh, a specific passage or, or a piece of, of information. A little different type is a, a personality assessment. And so you may ask about tendencies and preferences uh, on the job and away from the job. Uh, it could also be a work simulation kind of thing where you take a little piece of the job and you you turn it actually into an assessment itself. So there are a number of different formats that you might choose from. And as you're considering them, you need to also consider uh, just sort of some practical things like how much time are you going to have to administer this thing? What resources might you need in the administration process and in the scoring process in particular? Um, and then whether it's scalable, whether whether you can give it to hundreds or maybe even thousands of people and, and score it uh, without any people being involved. And so after you've determined what areas you're covering on the job and the, or on the test, and the type of test that you're using, you're going to develop some items. And, and we'll call them draft items at this point because you don't know if they're going to be on the final assessment yet. So you'll take the, the content areas that you've already determined and you'll have uh, different subject matter experts start to write the items based on the format that you're, you're choosing. Uh, at this point, you probably want a multiple choice uh, kind of assessment where you ask the question or you give the situation and then you have uh, maybe four uh, response options. With most multiple choice tests, it's best to have one right answer and three or four or however many alternatives, clearly wrong answer. Um, some of the times we'll see assessments out there where there's one right answer and then there are a couple of partially right answers and, and that can be confusing and, and uh, you want sort of a clear right and then multiple uh, incorrect answers. Uh, you can use open-ended uh, questions. Uh, in the past that had involved uh, experts rating the answers uh, these days AI can do some of that, but that involves uh, a level of complexity that maybe with your custom assessments, you don't want to get involved in. And at this point, it's really important to, to think about this as a draft set of items. You need to make more items than will be on the final assessment because 
in the review process and in the pilot testing and analysis process, you'll find some items just aren't working for one reason or another, and you need to drop them. So if you're going to have an assessment that has 20 items in the final assessment, you need to develop at least 30 items. And then in the process of, of analyzing things, you have some room to drop some of the items. So after you've written your draft set of items, then you need other people to do a review of the items. And it, I say other people because it's really hard for item writers to uh, impartially review the items that they've written themselves. And so you'll recruit maybe another subject matter expert or a couple of them uh, to review the items. In this process, you're going to want to make sure that uh, people of different backgrounds are are reviewing the items just so you're sure that every everything is understandable and, and clear for people from different backgrounds. Um, you might use what we'll call a cognitive interviewing process, which is basically getting people to respond to the items, but speak out loud what they're thinking. And so they'll say, oh, this item means this, and this response option, this is what I'm thinking about. And then you get them to verbalize what they're thinking. That's what we call a cognitive interview. And, and throughout the review process, uh, you need to make sure that any biased language or sensitive language is flagged and either changed or the item is just uh, re revised or, or gotten rid of altogether. And so you, you need multiple perspectives on each of these draft items in the review process so only the highest quality items get through. And then after you've had the, the items reviewed, you'll want to pilot test the items. And so with a pilot test, you'll, you'll need people who are similar at least to, uh, to your applicants or your candidates who are gonna be taking the final test to uh, go through the test as a participant would, answer the questions, and, um, and then you can do an analysis of, of the items. Uh, so in a, in a good pilot test, uh, you need to, to make sure that the people, they have a reason to, to try hard. Uh, if you have pilot test participants and, and they don't really care about doing well on the test, some of the times um, the results really don't represent what the, the final test uh, would be. So you need to consider the testing conditions. And, and at this point, you've put your items on the testing platform our platform maybe that you're going to be using. Uh, and once you start uh, collecting data, even from pilot tests, you need to be sure that you're covered from a, uh, from a legal perspective. And so you're, you're using the, the data correctly. You're storing the data correctly from the GDPR perspective. And it's, it's important to consider at this point, you really don't know how your items are gonna perform, how the test is gonna perform until you collect the pilot test data. So this is a really important step uh, and you don't need too many people, but uh, 50 people wouldn't be unreasonable at this point. More is always better. And then after you've collected your pilot test data, now you can do some analysis of those results. And, and I'll say psychometric evaluation, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, so one of the things you're going to look at is each item. Okay, what percentage of the people got the item right versus wrong? Um, so that's what we would call item difficulty. Uh, item discrimination is, okay, if they got an item right, does that correlate with how they did on the other items or on, on the rest of the items all put together? And that's what we'll call discrimination. So the items from a difficulty perspective they shouldn't be so difficult that uh, almost nobody gets it right, but they also shouldn't be so easy. If 99% of people get it right, uh, that item is really serving no benefit on the test. So if 90% of the people get it right, sort of that 50 to 90%, that's sort of a good target range. If, if an item is too difficult, it may mean that it's confusing in some way. And again, if an item is too easy, it's just not helping 
helping you uh, in the evaluation process. You might also do what you'll call a factor analysis. That's a little bit more of a complicated analysis, uh, but that looks like that looks at whether you should score the overall test as a single thing or if you should have multiple subscores of your test. So as we're looking at these things, we're considering uh, test reliability, test validity. Uh, we can do some fairness analysis at this point too. So some of these analysis are, are really straightforward and, and almost anybody could do it in Excel. Uh, some of them are a bit more complicated and, and you may need uh, an analyst to take care of them. And then after you've collected your pilot test data and after you've done your analysis, now you're gonna finalize your assessment. And as you're finalizing, as I said before, you're gonna be dropping some items. And so it is very common to, to drop 30% of your items, even 50% of your items before you finalize the assessment. And again, it's, it's dropping the items based on the analysis that you did previously. And as you're doing this, you need to be documenting uh, the process uh, in, a, in a report so you, so you remember what you did and you can show that you did a high quality uh, custom test development process. And then you need to be sure to document the scoring guidelines and so how you create your final score. Uh, some of the times it's as simple as adding the number of correct items together, but other times it can get a little bit more complicated if you want to present the result on a scale from zero to a hundred or something like that. Uh, some of the times there's an equation in there and you really need to be sure that you're documenting what the scoring guidelines are. And then at this point, you also need to be thinking about ongoing monitoring and maybe updating the assessment at some point in the future. So. You, you've developed your assessment and you're finalizing it, but you, you need to be sure that you're paying attention to, for instance, the number of people who are, are passing it or, or what does the scoring profile look like uh, because maybe you're going to see something uh, live in your data that you didn't see at the pilot test stage. And then after you have put your assessment together and, and maybe you've, you've rolled it out there are some other things that you need to think about from a from a challenges and a, a best practices perspective. So one of them, at least in the in the U.S., we'll talk about adverse impact, and that's that's if people from different groups pass at different rates. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that your test is unfair or illegal, but you need to be sure you understand this and. If there's anything that you can do to help reduce that or or do away with it altogether, you should consider doing that. But at the very least, you should be measuring it. You may get some pushback um, at some point for biased language or whether the assessment is job related or not. You've addressed some of these things in the test development process, but occasionally when the test is live, other people will have other thoughts about what biased language actually looks like and, and what uh, job relatedness or validity uh, would look like in those cases. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the regulations or the legal issues, again, in the US that you need to think about is ADA, which is Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, some of the time people will, will push back on different items or types of items if different, people with some types of disabilities are scoring worse, for instance. There's the uniform guidelines that you'll need to consider. And, and that's a, a broad set of guidelines that are fairly dated at this point, but it's still relevant. And those are the legal issues that you really need to consider. And as part of the, the consideration of the uniform guidelines, the EEOC guidelines, uh, which is the Equal Opportunity uh, commission, those are the things that you need to consider from a compliance perspective, again, in the U.S. So as we discussed, modern hiring comes with its own set of challenges, particularly in assessing and validating your candidates to ensure that they're a good, good fit for the job. 
So that's where the Zobin assessments can make a significant difference. And our platform, it makes it incredibly easy to create the tailored or custom assessments that we talked about today. And these are the ones that will accurately evaluate candidate skills and suitability for your jobs. Hiring managers and recruiters can leverage Zobin to streamline their assessment process and make informed hiring decisions. And you can take the next step in the hiring journey with Zobin and transform the way you assess talent. And that's it for this webinar. We hope you enjoyed our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you do not miss our new videos. If you have any doubts, please feel free to comment below and we will resolve those queries.